Howdy soldiers and welcome back to Remton Games. I'm generally hostile and today I'm going to be teaching you how to deploy your troops into foreign nations, spread your influence across the surface of the globe, and eventually dominate the entire planet. I am of course talking about the board game Risk. Before we begin I want to make one thing clear. Risk is a game of total domination where you have to be ruthless and show no mercy. You get your feelings hurt because someone took your Ontario territory, then you go cry in your safe space while I'll be kicking your soldiers' asses across North America. But if you think you have what it takes, well, hit that subscribe button and like the video, and let's get started. My grandpappy always told me the best place to start was at the beginning. And every game of Risk starts with the players divvying up the territories of the world like a bunch of 19th century Europeans. Spursions now do this randomly by handing out territory cards to each player. If this is the case, then you need to make sure that you put the bulk of your troops in territories that are relatively close together so you can consolidate the core of your empire in the first few turns. However, it's also important to make sure you're paying attention to where your opponents are placing their territories. You don't want to start off on bad footing by getting in a conflict right away. If you got to choose where you place your troops, then the same advice applies, except you also have to decide where to place your troops. We're going to talk about this more when we talk about the map in just a moment, but I would focus on putting my troops in North America, South America, or Africa in that order. Let's start by talking about the elephant-sized turtle in the room. What about Australia? Isn't that the best place to put your troops? You may be whining at your screen. And yes, starting in Australia is a very common strategy, favored by cowards who like playing for second place. Here at Rempton Games, we don't like second place. We play to win. The main appeal of Australia is that it's relatively easy to take and defend. You immediately get your two troop continent bonus, which means right out of the gate you're earning more troops per turn than anyone else at the table. And then you stockpile those troops either in Indonesia or Siam. Problem with this strategy is that it doesn't scale well. While two troops at the very beginning of the game can be helpful, it's quickly overshadowed by the amount of troops you can earn by conquering more territories, other continents and turning in your cards. At best, the other players mostly ignore Australia until there's only one other player left in the game, in which case Australia can earn their coveted second place. At worst, multiple players might be fighting over Australia from the very beginning, or refuse to trade territories with them, starving them of cards, or even gang up and try to take out the Australia player early on to prevent them from building up a stockpile of troops. Any of these options completely ruin the Turtles' plan. After Australia, the second easiest continent to take over is South America. It's only got four territories and gives you a two troop bonus. It is slightly harder to control than Australia because it has two entrances instead of just one. However, this also makes it a much more effective base for launching attacks from. Not only is it directly connected to two very good continents, North America and Africa, but it's only one territory away from Europe and two away from Asia. Australia, on the other hand, is only directly connected to Asia and is pretty well removed from the other continents. It's three territories removed from Europe and Africa, four from North America, and five from South America. Asia is nearly impossible to control until the end of the game. This leaves Australia with no good options for expansion. You know who does have good options for expansion? Africa. Sure, Africa's a little harder to defend than Australia or South America, but with only three border territories, it's still relatively defensible, and it gives you a larger troop bonus of three troops per turn, which makes it a very good continent to try to take in the early game. In terms of bonuses, Europe might seem like the best deal on the board. After all, it's only got seven territories, which is only one more than Africa, but it gives you a whopping five troop bonus. However, it's not as simple as it may seem. Not only does Europe have four border territories, more than any other continent besides Asia, but it's also in a very central location on the board. Because of this, players will often move their armies through Europe to get to other places on the board, or just put their troops there to defend their other territories without necessarily trying to control the whole continent. 
because of this, Europe's usually very hard to keep control of and often not worth the effort. The actual best deal on the board is North America. While nine territories might seem intimidating, most of those are internal. There are only three border territories that actually need to be defended. Combine that with its five troop bonus and its isolated location on the board, and North America becomes very easy to defend. The best part about North America, though, is that control and it makes it so much easier to subsequently conquer South America, and controlling both Americas gives you a very strong position on the board. Finally, we've got Asia. While a seven troop bonus can be very tempting, it's important not to fall for one of the classic blunders. The most famous is never get involved in a land war in Asia. It's basically impossible to maintain control over Asia unless you already have control over huge parts of the rest of the board, in which case you've basically already won. Now that we understand the map, let's get into the meat of the game, conquering territories. It's important to know when and how to attack, and equally important to know how to defend the territories you already got. First and most important thing to remember is that attackers in this game have a significant advantage that should not be overlooked. If both the attacker and the defender are rolling the maximum allowed number of dice, the attacker has an edge to come out on top. This means that on average, you'll lose fewer troops if you're the one attacking rather than the one being attacked. However, remember this is only true if you're attacking with the maximum number of dice. Because defenders win ties, if you're rolling with an equal number or fewer dice than your defender, then you're gonna be at a disadvantage. The good news is that it's the attacker that decides when and where battles take place, so if attacking would put you at a disadvantage, you can simply decide not to attack. However, even though attackers have the advantage, it's important to be careful when and where we attack. For one thing, any battle with a large number of troops is going to result in casualties on both sides. We want to make sure we don't leave ourselves open to an easy counterattack. Because of this, you should try to attack when your armies significantly outnumber the defending troops. A good rule of thumb is to aim for twice as many troops plus one for each territory you're planning to conquer that turn. You should also always be paying attention to your opponent's plans and waiting for an opportune moment when they leave themselves vulnerable to an attack. If opponent A makes a big move against opponent B, they leave themselves weakened and potentially vulnerable to an attack against opponent A. The order in which you attack territories is also vital. Pop quiz. Let's say you control Brazil and you want to conquer the rest of South America. What country do you attack first? I'll give you a second to think about it. Have your answer? Good. The correct answer is Argentina. We definitely don't want to start with Peru, because then we'll have to split our attacking force to the north and the south to conquer Argentina and Venezuela. Our odds are better with a larger attacking force, so we want to make sure we keep our army unified and attack in a straight line without branches. Why not Venezuela? Actually, a few reasons. First, Venezuela is the only territory we could conquer that would actually open us up to a new vector of attack due to its border with Central America. We should try to reduce our attack surface by conquering Argentina and Peru before putting ourselves at risk of attack from North America. Second, if we attack Venezuela first, then that means we're going to be attacking Argentina last, which means that the bulk of our attacking forces are going to end up in Argentina, which is a non-border territory. If we attack Argentina first, that means our troops are going to end up up north in Venezuela, shoring up our boundary with North America. Another aspect of the game that encourages players to attack is the territory card system. While different versions of Risk have different specific rules regarding the territory cards, what remains consistent between them is that you earn one card by conquering at least one territory per turn, and then you can turn in a set of cards for an influx of troops. These cards are very valuable, so you should always try to conquer at least one territory per turn if at all possible. 
the traditional wisdom around these cards is that you should try to hold them as long as you can and turn them in at the last possible moment to get the maximum value out of them. However, I disagree. The thing I think people forget to take into account with these cards is the opportunity cost of holding them. While it's true that you might earn a couple extra troops if you hold on to them for another turn or two, it's also true that turning them in earlier means you're going to conquer more territories early on, which means you might get that continence bonus quicker, which means that you're going to earn recurring troop revenue. You can think of it like a virtuous cycle. More troops helps you conquer more territories, which in turn helps you earn even more troops. Each turn you hold on to your cards is a turn that those troops could potentially be earning interest by helping you achieve your long-term goals on the board. When it comes to defending your territories, I've got three main tips. First, focus on defending your borders. Because internal territories aren't under direct threat of attack, and they can't attack your enemies, extra troops placed here are basically wasted. Second, focus on minimizing your borders. Ideally, you want to have only a few border territories, but with a large number of attack options. This allows you to concentrate your armies while forcing your opponents to spread theirs around. While it may seem like a disadvantage to have one territory that's under threat from multiple territories, this actually puts you at a huge advantage. To avoid presenting an obvious target, your opponent has to spread their troops out among the various territories, which makes it a lot harder for them to build up a single attacking force that can actually threaten your borders. Final tip for defenders is to try to keep your borders outside the boundaries of your actual continental territories. For example, if you control North America, you don't want your actual borders to be in Alaska, Greenland, and Central America. Instead, you want to put them in Iceland, Venezuela, and Kamchatka. This makes it impossible for your opponents to earn continental bonuses from South America, Europe, or Asia, it makes it harder for your opponents to take away your continental bonus and has the added side effect of increasing the number of opponent territories that border yours. Alaska, for example, only borders Kamchatka, which means that theoretically a player in Asia could try to build up a huge force of troops in Kamchatka and go across and attack North America. If you control Kamchatka, on the other hand, your opponents now have to fortify Mongolia, Japan, Irkutsk, and Yakutsk, spreading out their forces and severely weakening them. As much as Risk is a game about world domination, it's also a game about politics and shifting alliances. In order to be successful, it's important to know how and when to team up with other players and how to avoid getting teamed up against. The first rule of alliances, in Risk or anywhere, is that people team up when they both have something to gain from it. In order to form an alliance, you gotta convince the other player that being your ally is in their best interest. The easiest way to do this is to have a common enemy. Specifically, another player on the board with a very strong position that neither of you could handle well on your own. Working together with another player can potentially ensure both of your survival and get rid of a dangerous rival on the board. However, it's important to remember that alliances and risk, by definition, can't last forever. Eventually, there will only be two players left, and even if that other player was your former ally, now all bets are off. However, Alliances won't necessarily even last that long, and the other player will likely break the alliance as soon as they feel that it's no longer in their best interest. When it comes to alliances, I've got two main tips. First, try not to be the one that breaks the alliance first. Unless you're already very close to victory, it's important to remain trustworthy. Otherwise, if the other players see you breaking alliances without a good reason, they might see you as an untrustworthy shark and not want to make any further alliances with you, which puts you at a big disadvantage. 
my second piece of advice is to always be prepared for an alliance to fall apart. The other players at your table are probably perfectly nice, friendly people under normal circumstances. But you can't let your guard down. This is war, goddammit. You've got to be prepared for any eventuality. Well, fall into a false sense of security just because you made an alliance with another player, or you might open yourself up for an easy attack. For this reason, I prefer offensive trees, e.g. Let's both attack this other player rather than defensive treaties such as let's respect this border and move our troops away. Just as it's important to make deals with other players when it benefits you both, you definitely don't want two or more players ganging up against you. Because players tend to form alliances against the player that they consider to be in the lead, this means you gotta be careful not to put a target on your back especially early in the game. If the other players see you take an early lead right out of the gate, this can end up putting a target on your back that lasts the rest of the game, which is not a position you want to be in. Of course, if you're going to win, you eventually have to show your strength. But you want to try to fly under the radar as long as possible until you think you're strong enough to defend against multiple fronts, if it comes to that. My final piece of advice is to stay flexible. If you always do the same thing and play too predictably, then your opponents can exploit this. If you stick rigidly with a plan without adjusting it for what's happening at the table, it will fail. Even though North America is the strongest continent, if multiple other players are already fighting over it, then it's probably a better idea to focus your attention somewhere else. You might even be able to take over Asia earlier than expected if the rest of the table is following the traditional advice and avoiding it like the plague. If you remember to think outside the box and zig when everyone else is zagging, I think you're going to do just fine. That's all I have for today. If you like this video, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you don't miss more game strategy guides in the future. If you can't wait to see more, I've already got strategy guides on Monopoly, Catan, and Ticket to Ride, along with dozens of other videos and all sorts of game design topics on my channel. And join me next time to learn how to homebrew an artificer subclass in D&D 5th Edition. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.